<laughs> Hi, how are you? Wow, you guys should just all come and gather in the front. All right, I'm here to talk about uh, improving Java and Java EE with JRuby. Uh, anybody here using JRuby today? Groovy? All right, Groovy crowd, I see. <laughs> well, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I've been working with Java since 1997. Uh, like she said, uh, worked uh, on two books. I'm a speaker with No Fluff, Just Stuff, which is a conference circuit in the US. And I'm a professional Ruby developer too. So I'm a Java, Ruby, kind of the middle point is JRuby, which I feel very happy in there. And I'm currently learning, experimenting with Groovy to see how much of the Ruby that I know I can do in Groovy. So let me uh, start with talking about Java today and, and how we got here in the last you know, 10 plus years. So we have a 10, well, 12, 13 year old programming language and that's a long span for a programming language to stay as popular as Java is today. And uh, we have to, we have to uh, applaud Sun on, on how they kept the backwards compatibility to actually keep that language strong in the enterprise. Of course, keeping that backwards compatibility means that some of the cool features that we want, the developers, take longer to get in there. So Java is a new COBOL, and don't be afraid of that. It's a good thing. COBOL is not going away. It's been around you know, since before most of us were born, and will probably be around after we're gone. <laughs> but of course, you hear a lot of people coming from even the Ruby camp, which I'm, I'm part of that camp too, saying, well, you know, Java is dead, forget about Java, we don't need this Java anymore. But of course, try to find a Ruby job, even in the US, and it's pretty hard, but Java is everywhere. So yeah, Java is dead. Long live Java. So we, we know that Java is not going anywhere, and it's a stronghold of the enterprise in, in most of the world. Um, in, in my uh, part of the country in the US, the Midwest, we have a lot of banks and insurance companies and what we call traditional enterprises. In Java, it's number one there. .NET, it plays a role in more in the departmental applications, but for the big stuff that's crunching a lot of numbers in transactions, Java is where, where you want to be. So, but Java's not perfect, there's, there's some blemishes out there, and we really want to um, get past those with something that doesn't throw away all the investment that we made in the last 10 years. So we're adjusting to keep up with the changes. And uh, some of the dynamic languages you see on the JVM right now are a way that we're doing that. JRuby, Groovy, Jython. So in, there are parts of Java EJB 2x, anybody? Anybody done EJB 1, 2 development? I am sorry. I apologize on behalf of a lot of people. <laughs> but Java has a lot of really great APIs and a lot of powerful APIs that have matured really well and evolved to be pretty much sort of the perfect expression of what we're looking for in a specific domain. Uh, JMS is an example. Uh, messaging, if, if you, anybody of you uh, did uh, MQ series before, JMS, you know how painful that was. With JMS, that became you know, child's play, doing messaging, point-to-point, -point, uh, publish, subscribe. So we have APIs like JDBC2, which is a workhorse of, of you know, everyday work for most of us, uh, Servlet, which are the foundation to pretty much every web development uh, technology in the Java platform. So we have some really good APIs, but we have the not-so-good ones like EJB, I don't want to beat on EJB for too long, so let's move on. Uh, in uh, JSF, I am not a fan of JSF. I think it's over engineer, overly academic exercise, but that's for another day. So, but we have a secret weapon, and that secret weapon is the JVM. The JVM, Long after Java, the language would disappear and be uh, mentioned as something like, like Java developers mentioned C today. Uh, what was the last time that you wrote a, a, a JNI wrapper for a C class that you needed to improve performance? Long, long time ago. Um, it, it is funny now that a lot of places are comparing performance to how Java performs. So Java has become the new C or the new assembly. In the VM, the JVM, it's the new operating system. And um, the VM has gone through a lot of evolution. Even now, it keeps on evolving 
to, to become more adept to run uh, dynamic languages. And um, we're ahead of pretty much any other virtual environment in the market. So there are about 200 languages on the VM. Every student of computer science that's working on language design, the VM seems to be the platform that they tackle first to deal with that. So it, it is a, a, a place for innovation. In, uh, you know, in, in the US, we, 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 when we look for homes, we try to find that place with low taxes and, and really good schools. But that's what the VM is today. Anybody that's anybody that wants a language to be somewhere, it's going to put it on the Java VM. So again, if, even if, the, if Java, the language, starts decaying in usage for specific areas, the VM will be around like COBOL for a long, long time. So uh, some of the languages that we have are in the, in the new uh, dynamic language uh, sphere. We have Groovy, we have Jython, we have JRuby. Uh, they're all really uh, different languages based on where they came from. Uh, for example, Ruby came from a, a programmer's point of view, rather building something that was fun to program in and that took away a lot of the uh, crud that we actually have in a lot of languages like, like C and C++ and even Java. And we should not be afraid of these languages. These are really good welcome additions to the VM. Uh, I still do Java pretty much every day, but now I mix it up with Jython, with JRuby, with Groovy, and there are areas where we have really solid Java APIs that are hard to use. They're really flexible and powerful. With flexibility and power comes complexity. So some of these new dynamic languages are helping us to get to use those more effectively. And that's what Java kind of looks like nowadays. Uh, you remember the days when you know, you, the Java in a nutshell by O'Reilly was about this thick. Well, now it's like this thick. <laughs> and not even try to buy the Java EE <laughs> in a nutshell. I, I don't know how they have the courage to put nutshell on the title, but. <laughs> so what are we missing? Um, again, Java, very solid on the server side, powers most of the enterprise, but web development has always been a blemish in our repertoire in Java. I mean, we've we gone from servlets, from model 2, 2 plus 1, MVC flavors, struts. <laughs> Anybody doing struts? Sorry again. <laughs> struts was great when it came out, but you know, it's showing his age now. So web development is one of the areas where, where a dynamic language seems to handle things in a much better, a mu much more productive fashion than regular Java. And uh, some of these uh, frameworks that are based on dynamic languages have, have proven to be much better suited for web development. One example is all the hoopla that you know, we heard over the years, the last three or four years, about Rails, Ruby on Rails. And, uh, and now on the Groovy, side of the equation, we have uh, Grails, which I, I think is actually a better Rails <laughs> than Rails. So wh why did I choose JRuby? Well, why not? I'm still glad that I'm slightly skinnier than he is, <laughs> or, or was. <laughs> but Ruby, under the covers of JRuby, it's Ruby. And, and JRuby just happens to be another implementation of the Ruby language, and probably it's the best tested implementation out there. Because like, like coming from the Java uh, camp, the, the developers of JRuby have gone through the paces of doing unit testing the way we know how to do it. So Ruby is an object-oriented general purpose, which by general purpose, that, that's a very you know, flexible term, but, but means that it's a multi-paradigm language you can do from scripting, to fully, full-blown object-oriented applications, to web development, uh, even back-end development. It's an interpreted language, but JRuby now compiles to bytecode, which means that you can still create a JRuby application and turn it into Java bytecode and deploy it somewhere so nobody can obfuscate the, the, the bytecode if you need to, and you don't have that problem that everybody seems to be worried about that, oh, I'm deploying source code and anybody will be able to, to, to see it. So uh, even uh, companies like ThoughtWorks, they have a, pro a product called Mingle, and now they're packaging their JRuby Rails application 
as a WAR file uh, with a lot of the critical pieces uh, obfuscated. So it's a dynamic uh, language, and that's one of the, the, the things that normally throws uh, Java developers that are trying to bridge that gap between a statically typed language and a dynamic language. It's, it's, a, it's garbage collected, has a garbage collector. Uh, JRuby tends to write on all the facilities that Java, the VM, has. Uh, it is reflective, multi-paradigm. Again, you can write uh, procedural code, top, top to bottom, script like you used to do in Perl or PHP, or you can get as object-oriented as, as, as you want. And the, the thing that, that saw me on Ruby was the elegance of the code. I started looking at some of my, even uh, after a few years of doing Ruby, when I go back to my Java code now, I've learned how to make it cleaner and better just because I learned Ruby. It, it makes you think differently about coding. So Ruby was created by, by Matt, uh, Yukihiro Matsumoto in Japan, and it started in 1993, so it, it's older than Java, which is a funny thing. And it was released in 95, Java was released in late 96. Uh, and, and it blended Perl, Smalltalk, uh, Zather, iFill, CLU, uh, Ada, and Lisp. And I think the, the greatest influence is probably Lisp. Uh, I came from doing PC schemes, so going from Delphi to Java, uh, Scheme, and then going to Ruby kind of felt like the culmination of all those languages I learned. So the ideals. Programming should be fun, and the principle of least surprise. I don't know how well that applies nowadays, because Ruby has grown too, just like Java. Uh, you guys remember the, you know, write once, deploy anywhere, or run everywhere? Well, that always kind of, you know, <laughs> was the, the flag that we were waving about Java. And it's not that relevant anymore. I mean, it has relevancy, but not as much as it did in 1997. So let me show you what JRuby is all about. Again, it's a non-Java language for the Java platform. And you're going to hear from a lot of places, uh, possibly managers, um, that you shouldn't be using a different language than Java. Because you know we have made an investment in Java, and learning some other language is going to distract you from the knowledge of Java. But you already use a lot of different languages. I mean, you use XML all over the place, given it's not a language, but more of a format. But you use SQL. That's a completely different language. Um, you use Ant, and becomes a pseudo language for building. Uh, you might be using Maven again. So adding a, a new language to your repertoire will not hurt you. It will actually help you. Um, you guys probably went to some of Venkat's uh, talks, and one of the things that he's been repeating over the years is that you should probably learn a new language every other year. And I, I try to stick to that, and I kind of failed the last couple of years because I, I was having too much fun with Ruby. But again, some of the cool things that you can do with Ruby is that you can mix and match in JRuby. You can use Java libraries from Ruby. You can use Ruby libraries from Java. So it becomes a very seamless environment. Not as seamless as Groovy, but pretty close. Anybody here done uh, Swing development? All right. Later on, I will show you how much easier to do swing development with JRuby. So if uh, anybody familiar with, with, uh, with Ruby, you have Ruby gems that, are, that come pre-installed with JRuby. If you're using NetBeans 6, the, the JRuby support is great. Uh, Mongrel is one of the most popular web servers, uh, pure Ruby web servers, runs perfectly in JRuby, and Rails just works. So if you experimented with Rails, Ruby on Rails, and you want to bring that into the Java world, now you can deploy your Rails application just as a WAR file and still talk to even backend uh, services in Java like Spring. So uh, nowadays, Ju uh, Ruby uh, can, JRuby can produce bytecode. So that takes some of the uh, concerns a lot of people had before, that you couldn't, you couldn't uh, uh, deploy something that was secure. And it has a lot of corporate backing. The, the, the main two developers for JRuby are employed by Sun now, and that should show you the support that the, the language has behind it. Um, it's funny, the, the, the Groovy team doesn't have the same level of support that the JRuby team has, and Groovy is much more similar to Java than Ruby. And like I mentioned before, it's possibly the best tested uh, Ruby implementation out there. 
So to, to, to use JRuby, all you need to do is, is have a JDK greater than 1.4. So if you have 1.3, anybody using 1.3 today? Good, no web sphere people. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so all you need to, to have is a JDK greater than 1.4. And um, just like Java dash version, you have JRuby dash V, and you, you should, should be able to see which version you have installed. Again, you have to set up your class path, uh, sorry, your uh, binary execution path. Well, here's, here's a quick example. I'm just going to whet your appetite with this, and then we'll see a, a running example. But here's uh, what a piece of swing uh, code in JRuby looks like. Notice that I'm including Java, which is a module in JRuby, so I can use Java facilities in JRuby. And I'm importing uh, classes just like I do in regular Java. Then I'm creating an array list and adding frames. But notice how much simpler it is to construct a JFrame in JRuby versus regular swing. Uh, I'm adding those frames to that list, and then I'm uh, setting the sizes of all those frames in a one-liner iterator. So that's the kind of brevity in, 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 um, in simplicity that you will see in a lot of the Ruby examples. That in a lot of places you see 150 lines of Java code, and you get the same equivalent code in about you know, one-fifth of that. So. Uh, if you want to learn JRuby, one of the, the best things to do, rather than install the whole thing, is to get the uh, JRuby console, which is a Java Web Star enabled application. So you can just go to a website, click on the JMPL link, and have a console that you can start playing with. Um, so this JRuby console, it's called Jerb, which is uh, JRuby IRB, which is an interactive Ruby console. It, it is definitely the best tool to get acquainted with, uh, with JRuby. Of course, I'm using my mental powers right now to type. So in this example here, I'm using the JRuby console, and I'm typing a uh, Ruby string, double quotes, and then I'm calling a method on that Ruby string, which is swap case, which means reverse all the lowercase with uppercase and vice versa. So, and that's the beauty of, of, of Ruby today. You can really try things really fast on a command line without having to save a file, to commit any code, to start a new project, none of that. You can, you can get started really fast. And, uh, and another thing to notice here is that everything in Ruby is an object. So let's do a, a more uh, elaborate comparison, but still fairly simple. Let's say I have a, a file that has some strings separated by carriage returns. And I want to uh, do some I.O. processing with that file. I want to do it in Java first. So that's probably the shortest version that I could come up with. You can probably keep on simplifying this a little bit more. But there's some things that you just can't get away uh, with. So that, that's about the amount of code that I needed to do that in Java. Everybody familiar with that code? Sounds like something that you do all the time, huh? Read a properties file. So here's a first attempt uh, at doing this with, with JRuby. And I'm going to do it on the console. Well, I did it in the console in the past. And I'm calling uh, an open method on the file object. And I'm passing the name of the file in the directory, um, directory in the name of the file. So with that, I'm opening the file in read-only mode. And then I'm going to call an iterator on that result, on that file. I'm going to say, on each line of that file, put, it's like system.out, print the line. That's it, three lines. Nice, not bad. But you can see how that effect accumulates over your code base. And the less code you have, the less possibility that you would have bugs, and the simpler it is to understand the code. Again, this is not an exercise like we used to do in C. How, how much code can you pack into one line of C code and, and nobody, even you, the next day would be able to understand it? So this is different. The idea is to be simple, but not so simple that the code cannot be read. And by taking some of the, the, uh, the junk around the edges that Java makes you add, you can read the code better and understand it better and have less chances of ruining the code. So, of course, that was a, a nice attempt. But the cool thing about uh, Ruby is that they encapsulate common behaviors. So 
every once in a while I'm working with, with, with Java and I'm thinking, I wish the string class had method X. And of course, then I have to go to commons something, commons lang, to get a, a library to use that to find a method that matches sort of what I'm looking for. And the beauty of Ruby is that it's built by developers. There's no committee. So whatever Matt wanted to have in the language, he will just add. So here's a one-liner version of that same uh, I.O. code that we did. In here, I'm actually using the read lines method, which reads each line individually. And that's it. So you will find that in Ruby, there's a lot of, of, of the things that you would find in utilities in the Java world are already built in into the language. And if they're not built in, you can also change a lot of the core classes in the language to do what you want them to do. And again, readability, it's, it's the key uh, operating word in here. So I'm going to go through a couple uh, uh, items where I describe what my ideal wor world is and how we can use something like JRuby to make our day-to-day -day development better in, uh, in Java. So again, better web applications. Uh, I've, I've been stuck with struts for, for years, and uh, I've used a lot of, a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of different Java web frameworks, uh, from Wicked to uh, Spring MVC to Tapestry, uh, back to Wicked, then back to Tapestry, because I was not very happy. Um, so it's, it's, it's a world that's been very confusing for a lot of web developers, uh, especially when they, they threw Ajax into the equation. Now with Ajax, uh, things became uh, uh, fairly uh, complex, and we were trying to reverse uh, engineer Ajax into a lot of the frameworks that were already established in a, a completely server-side manner. So again, uh, Java, it's, it's there to stay, and we have a very rich ecosystem of web frameworks. And the thing that actually makes me stick with Java for the longest, it's the open source community. There is no platform or language that has the, the amount of, of, of projects out there, the amount of successful projects, and, and the, the support of the community behind them. Like Hibernate, it's a good example. The Spring Framework, uh, there's so many out there that, that um, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing out there forcing these people to do this, and it's all out there free for us to, to use. But of, of course, we have a lot of mediocre web frameworks, and that's always been a problem. Uh, I think we lost a lot of uh, business to the .NET camp just because of that. They had a uniform way to do things that sort of evolved in a very, uh, fairly well-known uh, direction, while in the Java world we were doing a lot of experimentation with our Java web frameworks. So in, uh, I, I was talking to uh, the, the main developer of Tapestry, and one of the funny things that came to, uh, to mind after a long conversation is that he really needed a dynamic language for what he was doing. But he was stuck with Java, doing Java, even with annotations and some of the new features in Java 5, some of the things that he wanted to do, um, for example, having to use IOC in, uh, in, in, uh, in AOP are usually not needed in a language like JRuby or, or Groovy. So how can we make our uh, web tier much better in, in, the, uh, in the Java world? using something like JRuby. Well, there's Rails out there. And Rails uh, developers have shown that the productivity gains are, are very high. And uh, uh, Rails seems to be at the forefront of the Web 2.0 movement. So Ruby on Rails, for those of you that haven't heard about it, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly new web framework starting in 2004, I think it was the first release. But it has evolved really fast. And it's a complete MVC solution. And I tend to refer to Rails as struts done right. And uh, one of the things that you know, people were wow at the beginning was the fast prototyping. How fast can you do applications with Rails? They had uh, a video blogs so, of you know, somebody put in a blog application in, in 10 minutes. And uh, of course, we all try to do the same thing with our framework of choice in Java. It's like, I bet you I can beat those Ruby guys with struts. Yeah, right. <laughs> So um, some of those things were, were pretty impressive. And of course, we have responded fairly well with Groovy and Grails. Uh, but one of the things that really pushed me towards uh, Rails uh, was the, the Ajax support.
So in one of the, the topics that you're going to hear about uh, when we talk about dynamic languages, it's DSLs, it's domain-specific languages. And dynamic languages are really good for implementing DSLs. And that's pretty much what Rails is. Rails is a DSL for the web. And b being born from a product, a base camp, uh, makes it uh, something that's tried and tested and not just UML diagrams in some lab in some company. So with JRuby, now you can use Rails to talk to your Java application. So let's say you have an application that has a solid backend, but it's been struggling with the web tier for years and years and years, and you've written the web tier from struts to JSF to JSPs to back to struts 2.0. Um, with JRuby uh, on Rails, you can have a solid, flexible, uh, easy to evolve web tier and still keep all your solid, well-tested core services in the back end. And like I mentioned before, even ThoughtWorks is it's selling a product that it's mostly JRuby and it's deployable as a WAR file. So here's a little example of how easy it is to create a JRuby uh, Rails application. So when you go home tonight, if you're not completely done with technology for the day, you can download JRuby and build a Rails application in five minutes. So in this example, I'm just using JRuby to run the Rails command, which uh, uh, comes built in with JRuby nowadays, and I'm creating an application called a hybrid pet store. In this case, I'm not going to add any specific functionality, but should show you that you can have a completely, uh, a full-blown Rails application running on a Java web container. And uh, it runs on Tomcat, on uh, WebLogic, on Glassfish, on JBoss. In this case, I'm running it with the built-in uh, Ruby web server, WebBrick, but it's running under JRuby. So everything is running on the VM eventually. So once I have that uh, running, I can launch my browser, go to the local port 3000, which is the default, and have a full-blown Rails application running in there. Of course, then you have to add your controllers, models, and a database, but it, it's, it's fairly easy from there. It's not like creating a Rails application in Java, in JRuby, it's much different than creating a Rails application in pure Ruby. And here's where the advantage comes. J2E servers are really good at scaling up. And we have you know, a VM that's tuned for multi-cores, uh, for multi-cluster multi, um, uh, systems. So we have uh, the, the VM being probably the best platform to deploy Rails out there. So again, deploying your Rails application as a WAR file, leveraging JDBC in Active Breaker. Uh, if, if you've seen um, GORM or Active Breaker, and if you've done uh, something like Hibernate before, you will find that the, the difference is night and day. It's so much easier to create a, a, a NOAA mapping layer or, or a wrapping layer with this framework than it is with, um, with straight uh, JPA or Hibernate. So the, the next topic I want to talk about is it's building. And um, in one of the books that I wrote, I did one whole chapter probably like 30 pages on Ant. And at that point, I was in love with Ant because I was using Make before or batch files. <laughs> so Ant seemed like the, the universe to me. Then, of course, I went to Maven and uh, back to Ant because <laughs> Maven just didn't work. Um, but how, how, how to get something like JRuby into the enterprise without affecting the deployable artifacts seems to be one of the key uh, things to, to get started with a dynamic language. A lot of companies will say, well, I don't want you to be touching the production code or changing anything into this dynamic language thing that you're talking about. But whatever else that doesn't go into the, the production server, you can change. So one of the places where we started to use uh, JRuby was in, in our, our builds. And uh, we know that Ant, you know, it, it's much better than Make, but all that XML. And when you want to do anything halfway complex in Ant, it becomes a nightmare. 
Uh, of course, then we have, you know, dependency management. You know, of course, everybody would end up with a live directory with a billion jars in there. And then if somebody else had some other jar that had the same dependency and they overwrote your jar, then some other framework didn't work. So then, of course, we invented Maven to make that easier. But we made all the parts of Maven so complex that only the creators of Maven can use it. So it always seems that I get stuck with that gigantic, you know, a thousand line build file for a specific project. And I was getting tired of that really fast. So uh, there's a project out there called Builder. In Builder, it's pretty much a drop-in replacement for uh, Maven. And you can also use Ant Tasks because, of course, everything that you can possibly want to do out there on an atomic level, it's encapsulated by somebody in an Ant Task. So th again, Builder doesn't throw away all that investment that we have made in the past but reuses all that stuff. You can uh, use the same dependency management mechanism that you have in Maven. You can talk to the same Maven repositories like iBiblio to get all your uh, specific uh, jars, but without all that XML madness. And with a real scripting language. The problem with Ant, when, when, when they invented Ant, they said, this is not a scripting language. This is a dependency uh, a chain of control type of uh, environment, and then people started saying, well, I want to loop through things, and I want to do an if and an else, and, a, and that's where AND gets really complex. So if you're going to try to do that, don't do it in XML. That's just asking for, for a painful experience. Do it in a real language, something like Ruby or Groovy. So Builder can help you get there. In, uh, in the Ruby world, we have a build tool called Rake which is based uh, on, on the ideas that Anne has, but done in a very clean fashion. So Builder is based on Rake. So again, they didn't, it, it, from, from, from the Ruby camp, they didn't throw all that knowledge away. From the Java camp, they didn't throw all that knowledge away. And created something that can reuse all that existing infrastructure in a much simpler fashion. And here's an example of what a Builder build looks like. And if you're familiar with Maven, uh, you can see that each, each part of the this description, the definitions, are tasks or, or targets uh, in, in an ant, or a specific dependency on your poem, an artifact in your poem in Maven. And, uh, and the beauty of this is that you have a real programming language now. You can have code completion. You can have, you can have tests for your build if you wanted to. So it takes, it gives programmers that power back that we lost with something like Ant or Maven. Because sometimes you know, you, you'll fire up the Maven build and you just have to cross your fingers because you don't know what's going on, you don't know if it's gonna succeed, if it's gonna fail. Um, at least Ant, it's consistent, but again, still too complex. So uh, a, build, a builder is one of those tools that if you're having a lot of problems with your Ant build today or your Maven build, this might be something you wanna look into. So the next topic I wanna talk about is uh, testing. In, in the Java world, we've been at the forefront of the, the unit testing, the test-driven development uh, field. But still, testing, it's a little bit of a pain in a statically typed language. So you can't really do test-first development in a statically typed language because you have to have something that was compiled to be able to test against it. And um, some of the things that you can get from the dynamic side of the fence is that ability to test things that don't exist yet so, so you can get the failures uh, that, that you expect, and, um, and then later on flesh out the code. So one of the things that you will find out there right now that's one of the, the, the latest trends in the testing-driven uh, uh, development world, it's uh, behavior-driven development. And uh, the main framework out there is called RSpec. And the really cool thing about RSpec is that it makes your tests read like documentation. So it, it's kind of like having executable documentation or an executable use case or, or user story. And um, having that level of readability makes the testing much more fun. And uh, there are even artifacts that you can use to prove that the code is working as needed. And you can show the output of those tests to a manager, and he would understand what's going on. So let me show you one of, one of these uh, RSpec tests. And this one, is, it's testing a Java class. So in this uh, uh, JRuby script, I'm requiring Java again so I can test again, I can interact with Java classes, 
and I'm including a, an account class that I created. Let's say it's some banking application. And the test begins uh, with the word context. Uh, I'm, I'm testing in the context of an account, a bank account in this case. And I'm saying that it should be empty, have a zero balance upon creation. And of course, here, it's, this will look familiar to you because it kind of looks like what you would do in JUnit. But again, the, the, remember when I mentioned DSL, domain-specific language? Well, RSpec, it's a domain-specific language for testing. Notice that I have, I'm, I'm invoking the balance uh, method on the account object, and I'm also invoking this method called should, should. And I'm saying that the account balance should be zero. And that is very readable and very clean. And all, all that behavior is being added dynamically by RSpec, the framework, to that object. So again, uh, some of the things that you would have to do in, in, uh, in Java, normally what, what I, would, I, I do in my JUnit test is have a big, nice comment that's pretty much saying what that is saying there. And when this test fails, it would use that string, should be empty, zero balance upon creation, as the output of the test. So it would say, uh, this failed because an account should be empty upon creation. So again, this is a, a, a nice way to create your test in a much cleaner fashion that they can be used to really track down um, against requirements how your application is doing. In our spec, it's just really the, the beginning. There's a lot of different uh, frameworks out there that you can use from the JRuby world and the Ruby world to make testing much easier, like mock, mock objects. Uh, we have some decent mock object frameworks for Java, like ECMock and JMock, but with a dynamic language, some of the complications of having to have a framework kind of go away. Uh, li like I mentioned before, some of the examples are um, not needing an IOC container for a lot of different things, not needing uh, I I AOP to actually test uh, specific uh, things that might be happening at runtime. So in the Ruby world, for example, we don't need Aspect J. The language provides those features. We don't have to have a different compiler, a different language, a different syntax, having to have runtime uh, weaving of, of the cross-cutting concerns. All those things kind of go away when you have a dynamic language. So the next topic, it's better prototyping. And this is one of those things that sometimes the real work starts after you finish that first prototype, when you have a solid semblance of what it is that is ahead of you in terms of, of, of the project uh, complexity. And it seems that sometimes in Java projects, it takes us a month to have a prototype of any sort, you know, an end-to-end. -end. You know, when they say end-to-end, -end, I want to have one web screen, I want to have one controller talking to, you know, a couple tables in the database, doing the OR mapping, and sometimes it seems to take way too long to get things like that uh, accomplished. And dynamic languages are really nice for getting prototyping done really fast. So here's an example about um, using JRuby to do a Spring Rapid application development. So I'm using JRuby for Rapid prototyping, and I'm creating controllers that delegate to a JRuby controller. So my controllers are very slim Ruby code. Uh, in this case, I have JRuby controllers living alongside the JSPs. So my application, the views are JSPs, and the controllers are JRuby controllers being managed by Spring. So here's an example of a controller. I have a calculator controller here that has a method to um, uh, get the model, <laughs> which really just has two values, x equals 2 and y equals 3 in this case. And I have a, a submit method. This is all being piped to a real Spring controller under the covers. And in here, I'm adding uh, two numbers, x and y, and I'm setting that to the uh, calculator results. And in, of course, in here, I have to instantiate the controller at the bottom. And so notice I'm mixing Ruby and Java seamlessly. Now I have a JSP file where I use the, the form to submit the values of X and Y to a JRuby controller that's running under the Spring framework. And then uh, I can test the application. 
So again, I have, this is running on a Tomcat, and I have my controller showing that form. When I click on that button, that controller is adding those numbers together. So again, very simple, but you can really prototype something really quickly with, with a dynamic language. And the cool thing is that normally you would test all these things on the console. I, I test the controller functionality on the console, and then just put it in that simple controller, which adds just a little bit more code, and I have a running application. So, so this experimental library supports accessing uh, Spring Beans from their JRuby code. So you don't have to throw away all that server-side code that you had built and tested for such a long time. Again, this is not about throwing anything away. It's just making things better, cleaner, simpler, uh, faster uh, turnaround times. Uh, you can access Hibernate queries with this, too. So again, it's, it's a very easy way to get J2EE application prototyping out the door in less time. Now, another example that I want to talk about is uh, a, a framework called Monkey Bars. Again, probably, I don't know how they choose uh, open source project names, but they're horrible. Uh, my next talk is on Drools, <laughs> which is a <laughs> rule engine. But I, again, it's one of those things that I have such a hard time explaining to my wife what it is that I'm doing. So uh, this monkey bars, it's a framework to make swing development in JRuby uh, possible. And, and the idea behind this is that you can still create your uh, swing forms in something like NetBeans or, or one of the uh, other uh, GUI editors and use that form Java code and control it from JRuby code. So you can write a, uh, a model of view controller pieces to control that swing view just like if it was a web application. So imagine that you have a swing form that you created. This one uh, it was created in uh, NetBeans uh, 6.1. So you have your form in there. Uh, it's a little very basic uh, swing form, no logic whatsoever. Now in in my JRuby code, using this framework, I can create a model. So I can now have a model that has a message attached to it. I have a view that maps that model to a specific piece of uh, text uh, label in the form. And I have a controller here that can uh, update that, uh, that, that uh, view. So again, this brings MVC development to Swing which is one of the things that, that Swing has always been missing. That's, that's why we have things like Eclipse RCP and, and frameworks built on top of uh, technologies like Swim or SWT to create that, that sense of order to our uh, uh, application. Um, if, if you guys, you know, the ones of you that know Swing, we know that Swing has MVC at the component level, but at the application level, there's nothing there. So this gives you MVC at the application level in, in a dynamic language. So of course, when you click on that button, uh, you get the updated message in there. And I'll show this on, uh, on. And so in here, uh, I'm going to bring, uh, I'm running Vista inside of a Mac. Uh, which, which is sort of like having a virus on my computer, but sorry, Microsoft people, I'm just joking. <laughs> so in here I have my application, and I'll open that Java form so you can take a quick look. Here's the swing form with that improve button and a label there. And here I have my controller, my model, and the view. And I can launch this. Oh, 
sorry, it's off the screen. Let me go grab it. Ah, there it is. So that's, there's a Swing application there running under JRuby. And all the actions are being handled by the framework without putting any Swing code into that form. So all you have, if you ever did um, Oracle Forms or Delphi development, you remember you had your DFM, your form, which was the view, and then you have the code to handle the events away from that. Well, this adds that flavor back into the equation. So again, I can write very clean Swing applications this way. So we have a few minutes left. Let me uh, run through the rest. Um, the last example, and this should take us you know, less than, than 10 minutes, it's uh, using better APIs. And I'll show you an example that I put together myself. Um, and it, it, this project is called XML, which sounds like what it is, XML. <laughs> and it's a JRuby DSL for XOM. And if you're done, uh, anybody done SACS or DOM parsing in Java? Sorry again. Isn't that a painful experience? Well, I, 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 I kind of tried every single Java uh, XML API out there. Uh, eventually, I was in DOM4J and JDOM, and then I stumbled upon XOM with ZOM, which is probably the best one out there. So the problem that I had is dealing with a lot of XML, and it is painful. It just takes way too long and too much effort. So I needed a, a simpler API for XML processing, and it had to be really fast, or fast enough, and produce well-formed documents, and having a very simple API. So I found uh, XOM, and uh, XOM gives you uh, JDOM and DOM capabilities, and also SACS-like capabilities. And uh, here's an example of creating a document with XOM. So it's a, it's a very simple um, uh, piece of Java code. And it makes consuming XML all, also very simple. But notice, notice the size of the, the Java files that I have in here. I actually have to break down in two pieces to, to show you the whole thing. So in the Ruby world, I was doing XML construction with something called Builder, which is uh, uh, created by Jim Wyrick. And uh, Builder is a DSL, the domain-specific languages for creating XML documents. So this is how simple it is to create a document in Builder that has a tag that says, hello world, and that's it. Uh, now, imagine trying to do that in, in Java without doing just a system.out. <laughs> um, so this creates that root tag that has the, the word hello world inside of it. So fairly simple in Ruby. I wanted that same facility in Java. But the thing with Builder is that it's not as robust as XOM. The, you can guarantee that you will produce well-formed or valid XML. In XOM, it's way faster. And also, so what I, I did here is I took the semantics of Builder and I built a JRuby DSL on top of XOM to get the best of both worlds. So the semantics of Builder and the XOM model under the covers. There's also no model in that JRuby uh, Ruby library builder uh, under the covers. So you start building something, it's just a string. In here now you have a full-blown object model behind it. So I created this hybrid. And this hybrid is at, at the Ruby Forge, in, uh, which is kind of like the source forge for Ruby project. And this is how easy it is for me to build XML documents in JRuby now. So here's a hello world document. Here's one, a more complex uh, uh, XML document. Notice that the purple uh, XML code is a resulting code from this uh, Ruby, JRuby code. So again, it looks just like Builder, but under the covers, there's an XOM model. It can also do things that Builder can do. I can read a file from, an, uh, from, from the uh, file system and, and preprint and process the XML. I can also do much more complex things. For example, here I'm creating an XML document that shows all the Fibonacci numbers uh, up to uh, 10, from 1 to 10. And here's an example. This is a really cool example. I'm using uh, XPath in, uh, to create, to read a document. 
from a specific URL. So again, imagine doing this in Java. I don't have to go against any I.O. libraries in here. I'm just saying URL equals this. That will read that uh, XML RSS feed in there. And then I'm getting all the headlines by doing an XPath, uh, grabbing the title of each uh, entry. And then, of course, a one-liner, which is typical in Ruby or Groovy, to print those uh, headlines. So again, this project is a simple example of the power of mixing a dynamic language with a well-known, battle-tested Java API to get something that is better than the combination of uh, both, and all running on the Java VM. So again, uh, if you're not using a dynamic language today, go learn one tomorrow. I don't care if it's Jython, JRuby, or Groovy. Pick one of those three and run with it. Uh, I will tell you also to learn Scala and Erlang and other things like that, but we'll do that some other day. Uh, we have a, a few books out there, uh, Seam, uh, Pojos, and uh, Enterprise Job on a Budget. So uh, thank you very much, and I hope that you will find this interesting later on. <laughs>